Do you ever wonder how organizations decide which projects to initiate? Well, it all starts with a business case, and I'll be showing you how to create one. So stick around. Hey, Doc Squad, Dr. White here with the Business Analysis Doctor. Today, I'm going to be showing you how to create a compelling business case for your project. But before we get started, if you want more business analysis training and tips, be sure to subscribe to the page and turn on that notification bell. Let's dive in. Now let's look at what you'll learn. First, we'll address what a business case is. Then we'll look at the primary business case audience, the main components of a business case. Then we'll go through some business case best practices, and then we'll walk through an example business case. A business case is a formal pre-project document that provides the justification or rationale for a proposed project or initiative. It outlines business needs, goals and objectives, solution options, and recommends a course of action. A business case is used to validate project benefits, assess solution options, recommend a solution option, authorize project initiation as an input for a detailed project charter, and it's also an input for the business requirements document. So who is the business case for? While it's common for the business analyst to develop the business case, the primary audience for the document includes the following. Sponsor. The sponsor is typically a senior executive or a leader within the organization who initiates a project and provides the necessary support and resources. This stakeholder is often the final decision maker for critical project issues, such as selecting the most viable solution option, and therefore will need to sign off on the business case before submitting to the steering committee for approval. Senior executives often comprise the organization's steering committee. A steering committee is responsible for providing guidance, oversight, and decision-making authority for the project. The key role of the steering committee is reviewing and approving the business case. They assess the document and ensure it aligns with the organization's strategic objectives and that the proposed solution is worth pursuing based on the expected benefits, cost, and risks. The subject matter experts play a crucial role in relation to the project business case, particularly during the planning and analysis phases. Their expertise is valuable in assessing the viability of the project. Subject matter experts will also assist in defining key performance indicators that will be used to measure the project's success. The business analyst often collaborates with the project manager to identify, assess, and mitigate the risks mentioned in the business case. The business analyst should also leverage the project manager's expertise regarding cost-benefit analysis and the project milestones for the implementation approach. The project manager also has a vested interest in the business case as it will ultimately serve as the starting point for the project charter which the project manager is responsible for. Technical subject matter experts within the IT team help assess the technical feasibility of the project. They evaluate whether the proposed solution is technically viable, taking into account current technology trends and industry best practices. They also play a critical role in defining the solution options. A financial analyst plays a critical role in assessing the financial aspects and feasibility of the proposed project. This includes conducting a detailed financial analysis of the business case. Business analysts should leverage the expertise of a financial analyst to examine the project costs, revenue, and potential financial benefits associated with the project. The initial financial feasibility estimates will likely be derived from a rough order of magnitude due to the limited information at the pre-project phase. After the approval of the business case, the financial analyst ensures that the cost estimates are as accurate and comprehensive as possible. Now let's look at the main components of a business case. This includes the need statement, the goals and objectives, the situation analysis, the alternative assessment, the cost benefit analysis, the risk analysis, the solution recommendation, the implementation approach, the evaluation measures, and supporting documentation. Now let's look at each of these components a bit closer. The first section is the need statement. Most business analysis efforts start with a business need. A business need may come in the form of a problem that must be solved or an opportunity that must be acquired. Business analysts generally perform a needs assessment to determine the the true driver for the business case. If the need statement is missing or incorrect, there's a risk that the wrong solution will be pursued. If the project driver is a problem, the need will be documented as a problem statement. The problem statement describes the internal or external issues that are causing damage to the organization. This focuses on the current problems such as revenue loss, dissatisfied customers, delays in operations and services, or non-compliance with regulatory requirements. These problems need to be solved by the project. If the project is driven by an 
opportunity, then it should be represented as an opportunity statement. Opportunity statements describe the current situation and outlines the potential areas of growth or improvement in a particular area. This may include opportunities to increase areas such as revenue, customers, markets, reputation, etc. These opportunities are to be seized by the project. The format of a situation statement is as follows. The problem or opportunity of X has the effect of Y with the outcome of Z. An effect refers to a direct or immediate result or consequence that arises as a result of a specific action, event, or situation. Effects are typically the direct outcomes of a cause and effect relationship. They're often easier to measure and quantify, and they're more specific and narrowly focused. An impact, on the other hand, refers to a broader, more far-reaching and often long-term consequence of a situation or event. Impacts are typically the result of a chain reaction of events and can affect various aspects of a system or environment. They're often harder to measure and may be delayed or have cumulative effects. Impacts are more significant than effects and they can shape the overall trajectory of a situation. For example, the problem of frequent website crashes has the effect of increased customer complaints with the impact of customer loyalty decline and decreased revenue. Next is the goals and objectives section. Together, goals and objectives describe the outcome or final state once the initiative is complete. The goal statement is a high-level qualitative statement that indicates the long-term intentions of the initiative. For example, increased customer satisfaction. The objective statements, on the other hand, are specific short-term statements that decompose how the goal will be achieved through quantitative measures. For example, increase the organization's net promoter score by two points within six months. To ensure objectives are clear and concise, they should be validated to ensure they meet the SMART criteria. Specific objectives describe something that has an observable outcome, leaving no room for ambiguity. That might answer the question, what needs to be accomplished? why it's important, or who's involved. Measurable objectives are tracked to measure an outcome. This involves quantifiable metrics or indicators that make it clear whether the goal has been met or not. This provides a way to gauge success. Attainable objectives are feasible and realistic in relation to the effort to achieve them. Objectives should take available resources, skills, and constraints into account. Relevant objectives align with the enterprise's vision, mission, and goals. Irrelevant objectives waste time and resources. Time-bound objective provides a clear endpoint for evaluation. Next is the situation analysis section. This is a representation of the current state or situation. Here, the business case describes the impacted functional areas for the initiative, the existing capabilities, the current performance, and the impacted stakeholders. The situation analysis should elaborate on the problem or opportunity statement. Once the current state has been described appropriately and agreed upon by stakeholders, it needs to be analyzed further before taking action. For problem-driven projects, the business analyst needs to further analyze and decompose the problem to determine the true cause of the problem. A cause and effect diagram, otherwise known as the fishbone or Ishikawa diagram, is one of the primary techniques used to identify the core problem, which will enable the team to plan for a solution that resolves it. For opportunity-based initiatives, the business analyst may perform an opportunity analysis. This is a systematic process used to evaluate major components of potential opportunities in various contexts, such as marketing, investments, and product development. The goal of the opportunity analysis is to make informed decisions about whether to pursue a specific opportunity or not. Impact mapping and SWOT analysis are commonly used to facilitate opportunity analysis. For more details on the SWOT analysis, see the link in the description. After the current capabilities from the current state analysis and the desired capabilities from the objectives have been established, the business analyst will be equipped to perform a gap analysis. A gap analysis is a technique for understanding the gap between the current state and the future state. The missing capabilities between these two states is what defines the gap. The definition of this gap is what forms the solution options, including high-level features and functions for each. The basic components of a gap analysis includes the outlining of the current capabilities, the needed capabilities, the gap identified, and the required action. Following the selection of the solution option and the approval of the business case, it's likely that a more in-depth gap analysis is performed. See the link in the description for more details on performing a gap analysis. The next section of the business case is the alternative assessment. Generally, there will be more than one solution that can address the business need. 
This section will assess the various solution options and describe each one at a level of detail sufficient enough for decision makers to make an informed decision. The first consideration for the alternatives is the solution approach. The solution approach is the overarching method the organization will take to achieve the business goals and objectives for the project. These solution approach options are particularly relevant when addressing specific business needs involving new technology, software, or systems. A common decision to be made is whether the organization should build the solution in-house or buy a commercial off-the-shelf solution. This is commonly referred to as build versus buy. The build option involves developing the solution in-house using the organization's technology resources, expertise, and capabilities. The buy option involves selecting an external vendor or solution provider to acquire an existing product or service to address the business need. The organization may also opt to do a combination of both, purchasing a solution and then making in-house customizations to it. If a purchase solution is deemed to be the most valuable, an external supplier will be a critical aspect of the solution, and choosing between vendors is an additional decision to be made. This is often facilitated with a vendor or supplier evaluation assessment. If a solution approach is predetermined, the organization may also assess solutions based on effort. This may be referred to as solution option levels. When considering solution option levels, constraints are a key influencer in the decision-making process. A common hierarchy for solution option levels include do nothing, minimum effort or low impact, maximum effort or high impact, do nothing or status quo. In this option, the organization chooses to maintain the current state and not take any action to address the problem or opportunity. It implies that the organization is willing to accept the current situation and its associated risks, costs, or limitations. This option is often used as a baseline for the comparison to the other solution options to assess their relative benefits. Minimum effort and low impact. This option involves making minimal changes or investments to address the problem or opportunity. It focuses on achieving small incremental improvements. The changes made in this option are typically cost-effective and low risk, but they may also result in relatively modest benefits. Organizations may choose this option when they have limited resources or when they want to test the waters before committing to a more significant effort. Maximum effort, high impact. This option represents a comprehensive and transformative approach to addressing the problem or opportunity. It often involves significant investments of resources, time, and effort. The goal of this option is to achieve substantial and far-reaching improvements or benefits. It may lead to a fundamental shift in the organization's operations or competitive position. Organizations may choose this option when they're willing and able to make substantial commitment to change and believe that the potential rewards justify the investment. Now we have the cost benefits analysis section. A cost-benefit analysis is an evaluation process used to assess the pros and cons of a proposed project or solution. It involves comparing the cost of a course of action against the expected benefits to determine whether the solution is economically justified. The goal of a cost-benefit analysis in a business case is to provide decision makers with a clear understanding of the financial implications and potential returns associated with the specific project, solution, or course of action. Now. Let's look at some key aspects of the cost-benefit analysis. First is a feasibility study. A feasibility study assesses the viability of the potential solution options for the various aspects, including technical feasibility, operational feasibility, and economic feasibility, among several others. As a best practice, a high-level cost-benefit analysis should be performed for each solution option to determine the economical viability of each. The outcome of this assessment is used as an input into the alternative assessment mentioned earlier in the lesson. After one of the alternative options is selected as the recommended option, a more detailed cost-benefit analysis is performed using more extensive financial analysis calculations. This financial analysis aims to determine whether the benefits of the recommended options outweigh the associated costs, helping decision makers make an informed choice when determining whether or not to move forward with the recommendation. The high-level estimates from the feasibility study are now elaborated upon with a rough order of magnitude estimates of benefits and costs. As more information becomes available during the project initiation, the rough order of magnitude estimates will be replaced with more accurate figures. 
There are various valuation methods that can be used during a financial analysis. These methods are calculations used to determine the figures in the cost-benefit analysis. The valuation methods used depend upon the organization's standards or the nature of the project. Some of the most common methods used for a business case include internal rate of return, the net present value, the payback period, or the return on investment. The internal rate of return calculates the annual rate of growth at which an investment breaks even and generates returns. It represents the discount rate at which the net present value of all future cash flows from the investment equals zero. This metric helps evaluate the attractiveness of an investment. A higher internal rate of return value indicates more desirable investment opportunities. The net present value, or NPV, is used to evaluate the profitability of an investment. It calculates the present value of all future cash flows of an investment minus the initial investment. A positive net present value indicates a profitable investment. It helps in comparing the value of money today to the value of money in the future. The payback period is the time it takes for an investment to generate cash flows equal to its initial cost. It measures how long it will take to recoup the initial investments from the cash inflows it generates. Shorter payback periods are generally preferred as they indicate quicker returns on investment. The return on investment is referred to as the ROI. It's a ratio that compares the net profit from an investment to its initial cost. It expresses the return of an investment as a percentage of the initial investment. The ROI evaluates the efficiency of an investment. A higher return on investment indicates a more effective use of the invested capital. Generally, the cost-benefit analysis is where the business analyst will need to collaborate with the project manager to determine the initial estimates for the business case. And for the more detailed figures that use valuation method, the expertise of a financial analyst is recommended. The next section of the business case is a risk analysis. Analysis. A risk analysis is a systematic evaluation of the potential risks and uncertainties associated with the change. While the primary purpose is to identify, assess, and prioritize risk to make informed decisions, it also involves the identification and management of constraints, assumptions, and dependencies that may lead to risks. As a best practice, a high-level risk analysis is done on each solution option in addition to a more comprehensive risk analysis for the recommended solution. But this may vary depending on the organization, and the scale of the project. Now let's look at the components of a risk analysis. Constraints are influencing factors that cannot be changed and create limitations or restrictions on the product or the solution. In addition to resources, common constraints include time, cost, and scope. Assumptions are influencing factors that are considered to be true but has not been verified. These assumptions play a critical role in planning and decision-making processes for the change. They provide a basis for estimating costs, forecasting revenues, and assessing the feasibility of the proposed endeavor. Common assumptions that may be documented in the business case may be market assumptions, technical assumptions, operational assumptions, or financial assumptions. Because assumptions are not certainties, they carry inherent risks. Risks refer to the potential events, unknown circumstances, or factors that could negatively impact the success or viability of a proposed business initiative or project. Identifying, assessing, and managing these risks is a crucial aspect of the business case development process. Risks to consider for a business case may include market risk, financial risk, operational risk, technical risk, or financial risk, among others. Dependencies are the components of the solution that are dependent on the completion of internal or external project factors. Common dependencies may be the implementation of requirements that are dependent on other requirements, decisions to be made, resources, funding, or other constraints. Now let's look at the solution recommendation section. This is a critical section where the proposed solution or course of action to address the business need is presented and justified. It clearly describes the recommended solution in detail. This should include what the solution entails, how it works, and its key components or features. This section explains how the recommended solution directly addresses the identified business need outlined in the business case. The optimal course of action clearly outlines the recommended solution and the key functions and capabilities that comprise that solution. A key element here is to discuss how this course of action aligns with the organization's strategic goals and objectives. It also specifies how it will directly solve the business problem or realize an opportunity. The solution options ranking presents the results of evaluating and prioritizing the potential solutions for the project. It summarizes the alternative assessment and scores each option on how well each option performs against the established criteria. 
This is often presented using a weighted ranking matrix. This visual helps highlight the reason the recommended solution option is most viable and valuable to the organization. Next is the primary reason for the selection. This section further elaborates on the rationale of the solution recommendation. It references the evaluation criteria from the alternatives assessment to emphasize why the selected option is considered optimal compared to the other options. This section provides additional commentary on the results of the option ranking matrix to give additional context to the decision makers regarding the selection. This is another opportunity to highlight the benefits associated with the recommendation. The next component is outlining the key deliverables of the recommended option. This is a critical step in the planning and implementation process. While the recommended features represent the functions and capabilities of the solution, the deliverables serve as tangible, measurable outcomes that define the success of the recommended solution. These deliverables serve as inputs to the implementation approach. The next business case section is the implementation approach. The implementation approach elaborates on the gap analysis to outline a roadmap to guide the organization through the implementation process should the recommended solution be approved by the decision makers. Depending on the information available, the implementation approach is likely to be high level and will need to be further elaborated after the project is formally approved. Now let's look at the key components of the implementation approach. Milestones are strategically identified events that mark key progress points throughout the execution of the solution. They serve as checkpoints to assess whether the project is on track and meeting its objectives. These milestones are essential for effective project management as they help ensure that the tasks are completed as planned and provide a basis for monitoring the project. Roles and responsibilities play a crucial role in the successful implementation of the business case. They help define who is accountable for various aspects of the project and ensure that the tasks are completed effectively. These roles and responsibilities may be presented in the form of a Rossi matrix included within the implementation plan. The Rossi adds clarity, reduces ambiguity, and minimizes the risk of solution-related tasks falling through the cracks during project execution. Next is implementation dependencies. These dependencies are separate from the risk analysis dependencies. Implementation dependencies specify the relationships between different tasks, activities, or elements within the implementation plan. Managing these dependencies is crucial for ensuring that the solution implementation progresses smoothly and achieves its objectives. The timelines for a business case outlines the schedule for executing the recommended solution. Here, it may be beneficial to collaborate with a project manager to develop the initial timeline. While a clear and realistic timeline is ideal to help manage resources and setting expectations, it's likely that the timeline will be rough estimates and will need to be revisited by the project manager down the line. The next business case component is the evaluation measures. These are metrics and key performance indicators that form criteria to determine the success of the project once it's been implemented. These criteria also help decision makers evaluate whether the project aligns to the organization's strategic goals and whether it's worth pursuing. The first part of the evaluation measure is the metric description. This refers to a detailed explanation of how a specific measurement will be used to assess the particular aspect of the proposed project or solution. It provides clarity and context to the stakeholders about what the metric represents and why it's relevant to the evaluation process. Metrics descriptions are important in the business case to ensure that there is a shared understanding of how success or performance will be quantified. A method of measuring refers to the specific approach, technique, or process used to assess and quantify the performance or success of a project with respect to the criterion. These methods are essential to collecting metric data and information that can be used to make informed decisions about project feasibility, progress, and overall impact. Common methods for measuring in the business case evaluation include key performance indicator reports, surveys and questionnaires, financial reporting, quality assessments, scoring systems, or customer feedback. Next are baseline metrics. Baseline metrics represent the starting point of measurement before any action has been taken and will serve as a reference against which changes, improvements, or deviations are assessed. They provide a benchmark or point of comparison to evaluate the impact and effectiveness of a project or solution. Baseline metrics are crucial for understanding the current state or performance of an existing solution before the project is implemented and is key for tracking progress throughout the project lifecycle. 
target metrics are specific and quantifiable goals or benchmark that the project aims to achieve. They serve as clear and measurable objectives against which the project's performance is assessed. These target metrics are critical for setting expectation, tracking progress, and determining whether the project has successfully met the intended outcomes after implementation. Target metrics should be quantitative and measurable and should align with the business objectives. Now let's look at the supplemental sections of the business case. These are additional sections that provide additional context, background information, or supporting details that are relevant to the business case. These sections can vary based on the project or organization. Common supplemental sections that may be included in the business case include the appendix. The appendix includes any attachments or links to additional information outside of the actual business case that is relevant to the project, such as diagrams or financial charts and tables. Then there's the approvers and sign off. This section includes the signatures of all stakeholders with decision-making authority to indicate their approval of the business case. Sign off ensures that all stakeholders are in agreement with the project as defined in the business case and the recommended solution. The approval of the business case, however, signifies the organization's agreement to move forward with more exploration and analysis of the project or solution. It authorizes the formal initiation of the project and enables the document to be used as the base for the project charter. Now let's go through some best practices for developing a business case. Perform a needs assessment prior. Before diving into the business case, conduct a needs assessment to identify the specific problems, challenges, or opportunities that the project aims to address. Understanding these needs provides a solid foundation, ensuring the project aligns to the organizational requirements and addresses genuine issues. Be as brief and concise as possible. Conciseness is key in a business case. While it's essential to include all necessary information, unnecessary details can dilute the message. A concise business case is easier to understand and more likely to hold the attention of the stakeholders. Focus on presenting essential information clearly and directly. Ensure the vision for the future is clear. Clearly articulate how the project aligns with the organization's long-term vision and strategic goals. A well-defined vision helps provide context, helping stakeholders and decision makers understand the project's purpose and its potential impact on the organization's future. Ensure the value of the project is clear. Explicitly outline the benefits and value the project brings to the organization. Quantify tangible benefits such as cost savings, revenue increase, or efficiency improvements. Additionally, highlight intangible benefits such as enhanced brand reputation or customer satisfaction. Leverage the expertise of subject matter experts. Be sure to involve relevant stakeholders and subject matter experts in the business case development process. Gather insights from individuals with diverse expertise to ensure a comprehensive and well-formed document. Key areas of expertise will include the business subject matter experts, a project manager, a financial analyst, and an IT expert. Also, keep the business case up to date. A business case is a dynamic document that should be updated regularly especially if there are changes in project scope, budget, or market conditions. Keeping the business case current ensures that stakeholders are working with the most recent and accurate information. Once the business case is approved, the business case will often be expanded upon by the project manager to create the project charter. After this handoff, the project charter will be updated and maintained throughout the project. All right, now let's look at a business case example. The organization that we're gonna be looking at is a university that's gonna be implementing a new website for the admissions department. So of course, we'll have the admissions department website as our title and the business case document as well listed. The version number as well as the date. And I like to include whatever the organization logo is um, on any type of documentation that I am developing as a part of a project. And by the way, this template is a part of our BA templates package, so you can grab that through the link in the description and the comments. All right, so now we've got our revision history where you include any changes that you made, including the date, the version, and the author of the change. Next is our table of contents. Nothing too exciting there. Okay, so the first section is the executive summary. This section should provide an overview of the project at a glance, and it often consolidates many of the components within the document. So the first subsection we have here is the need statement, which in this case is a problem statement. We're saying that the admissions department is currently bombarded 
started with calls and appointments with students and potential students who need assistance regarding that missions. Currently, the department has been exceeding application SLAs by two weeks on average. And this is frustrating to the applicants and it's leading to cancel applications and reduction in admission to the school. And as you can see, this does include the format that I presented earlier, including the problem, the effect, and the impact. All right, next we have our business goals. And here we're saying that the goal of the project is to provide a best-in-class self-service site for the admissions department. Then we're going to break that down to some key objectives. Some of the objectives we have is to reduce the department call volume by 50% within one month of implementation and to reduce appointment volume by 25% within one month of implementation. As you can see, these meet the SMART criteria. All right, an example of the success measures includes the number of incoming calls. These are things that we're gonna be looking at after the implementation of the project. Okay, the next section is the situation analysis. In this section, you'll be communicating the results of the activities performed during your needs assessment. So for the current state, it was observed that the current capabilities of the school admissions department website are limited. Students can track progress of the application to the website, but there are no self-service capabilities that will allow them to initiate the application. So for the root cause analysis, we found that the problems were caused by a lack of integration between systems, complex and outdated admissions processes, and limited self-service capabilities. Okay, for the gap analysis, we're conveying the results through a table. So some of the features we're looking at is tracking the application status. And this is something that is available in the current state, but the gap identified is that the system integration only updates nightly. So the corrective action is that we want to implement real-time system integration updates. Another example is the ability to submit online admissions applications. This is not something that's available in the current state, and we do want it in the target state. So the gap identified is the limited self-service capabilities. And then the corrective action here would be to implement online application submissions. Now we have our alternatives assessment. This section includes the assessment of the overall solution approach as well as the feasibility of possible solution options. So for the solution approach, we're going to recommend developing the admissions website improvements in-house instead of purchasing from a vendor. Some of the benefits of the in-house development might be better alignment with the school's needs, greater control over the development process, and lower cost in the long run. Then we have our feasibility study. And here we're using a ranking matrix to assess our solution options. Here we're gonna look at doing nothing, the minimum effort and the maximum effort. So the do nothing effort here is to maintain the current state of the admissions process with no changes. In terms of technical feasibility, uh, that is feasibly high, right? We definitely have the technology to do nothing. Um, in terms of operational feasibility, I'm going to score this as low because even though we do have the operations to not do anything, it's not sustainable for us from an operations perspective. Same thing for the economic perspective. Even though it won't cost anything to do nothing, financially, it's not feasible for us to continue down this path. So this is going to have an overall viability score of one. Next up is the risk analysis section, which includes a high-level overview of the known constraints, assumptions, risk, dependencies that are identified during the needs assessment. So for constraints, we have that only forms that do not require wet signatures can be submitted online. An assumption that we might have is that the website will be available 24-7 outside of the scheduled maintenance. A risk could be that the proposed solution will rely on the website's ability for application processing. This means that the team will need to outline a contingency and communication plan in cases when the website is down. And a dependency might be that all forms will need to be transitioned to an online format before implementation. Okay, now let's look at the recommendation section. This section should outline the outcome of the needs assessment as well as communicate information from the benefits management process. For here, we're recommending the implementation of the maximum effort for developing the admissions website in-house. So some of the key capabilities and functions here include 
the ability for students to submit and track their applications online in real time, and the ability for students to view their admission status and communicate with admission staff. The next subsection is the alternative assessment. See, alternative assessment is both a section on its own as well as a subsection within the recommended section. It's included here to support the recommendation rationale that follows. So the assessment for the project considered two other options that we talked about. So the do nothing option as well as the minimum effort option. The minimum effort option included the implementation of minor improvements to the self-service portal, such as improving the ability for students to track their application status. This was rejected because it did not provide the same level of benefits as the maximum effort option. So for the recommendation rationale, we made this selection because it provides the greatest financial and operational benefits to students and admission staff. And it's the most effective in addressing the root causes of the issues identified. Some of the key deliverables for the recommended solution is a new self-service website for students, as well as integration of the new site with the admissions, student records, financial aid, and registrar systems. Next is the cost benefit analysis of the recommendation. As you can see here, we have our payback period table uh, over five years. And some of the things we're looking at are operational costs, development costs. One thing I'll say about development costs is that it will be a good idea to leverage the expertise of some of the IT professionals or the IT management in order to get a semi-realistic understanding of what those development costs would be. Also, you want to look at some tangible costs as well as some intangible costs. So again, you want to collaborate with your financial analyst to come up with some of these figures. Next, we have our implementation approach where we're outlining the key milestones of the project as well as the roles responsible for completing them. Also, we're including any dependencies and the duration of the activity. Some examples include redesigning the admissions process. This will be done by the admissions staff. As you can see, the admissions staff will be responsible for this. And a dependency here would be the availability of real-time updates. And then we're estimating that this might take a month to complete. Another milestone might be the implementation of real-time system updates, and the development team will be responsible for implementing this. A dependency here would be the development of the new admissions website, and we're expecting the implementation of the real-time updates to take no longer than one month. Now we have the evaluation measures. This section outlines the metrics that will determine whether or not the project was successful. Some of the metrics included here are incoming calls, so that's a 50% decrease. Another metric is in-person appointments. So we're going to be looking at the average number of in-person appointments at the admissions office per day. And we'll be using the appointment scheduling system to track this or measure it. The baseline is 50 appointments per day, and we're trying to get that down to about 40 appointments per day. Then we have our appendix section where we're going to include any documents that may have been generated during the needs assessment or the benefits management planning. And finally, we have our approval and sign off section, which usually includes the approval of the sponsor as well as members of the steering committee. Once the business case is approved, the project initiation can formally begin and then the document will be handed over to the project manager to expand into a project charter. Well, there you have it, folks. This is what you need to create a business case that will get your project approved for prioritization. If you have any questions, be sure to ask them below and I'll get back with you. Also, be sure to check out all of the business analysis and certification training available for you at thebadoc.com. Thank you so much for watching. Have a productive and prosperous day and I'll see you next time. Bye now.